Hey everybody, it's Russ Barkley back again. What do you think of the new shirt? Getting into golf season here, so I've decided to break out my summer colors. Hope it's not too blinding on you out there. In any case, today I want to tackle a subject that seems to crop up every few years in the trade media and goes back to the early 1980s, if not before, in terms of when this was proposed. And that is the idea that consuming sugar, particularly by children, causes ADHD. I mean, this is an idea that will not die. I feel like I'm playing scientific whack-a-mole with this idea where every few years it pops up again and we review the evidence and we whack that mole back down again. And then later on, five years or 10 years later, it's back in the trade media again. It's part of contemporary beliefs among the general population that this must be true. I hear this all the time from families. Oh, he had sugar. That's going to make him wild or more ADHD. Uh, and so it, it's still out there. I mean, it really is the idea that won't die. Now, part of the reason that it seems to have some sort of sustained life, at least out in the trade media, is that there are a number of studies that do show a correlation between consumption of sugar, and degree of ADHD symptoms. Now, as it turns out, many authors of these studies have leapt to the conclusion that sugar, therefore, must be a contributing factor to ADHD. I mean, even modern studies on this topic, the authors seem hell-bent on reaching that conclusion from what is simply a correlation. And we know you can't do that. So let's begin with a quick review, a meta-analysis of the literature. This one back in 2020, but I have no doubt that any subsequent studies are probably consistent with this one. The authors found that there were seven studies that met their review criteria that had to do with a relationship between sugar consumption, whether through sugar beverages or through more general sugar food consumption, and ADHD. And they conclude that out of all of these studies, which included over 25,000 individuals, they did find that there was a small but significant positive relationship between the amount of sugar consumed and the degree of ADHD symptoms. Ho-hum. But even these authors, just four years ago, go on to say that this provides evidence that consumption of sugar worldwide might be contributing to the increase in the prevalence of ADHD, or at least symptoms of ADHD, in the population. Well, friends, you just can't say that from this correlation, because it is equally, if not more plausible, that the more ADHD you have, the more impulsive you are, the more prone to addiction you are, the more likely you are going to turn to the high-carb, high-sugar foods and beverages. We've seen this in longitudinal studies as well. So it's not only just as plausible, it's even more plausible. And yet, authors seem to ignore that more plausible idea. So how can we, again, refute this notion that because sugar and ADHD are correlated, it's the sugar that's causing the ADHD symptoms. Well, the first thing that we can do is to do a longitudinal study following individuals over time, children in this case, measuring their sugar consumption and degree of ADHD at time one. This study did that at six years of age. Following the children up for a period of time, in this case about five years, and then looking at degree of ADHD and sugar consumption over that time. And there are statistical ways that you can then use these data to look at a possible causal relationship. And that's what they did. So what you do here is you look at does sugar consumption at age six, controlling for ADHD at age six, does sugar consumption predict an increase in ADHD symptoms over time? What did the study find? No. So that tells you it ain't the sugar. On the other hand, the converse analysis, where they looked at does ADHD at age six predict sugar consumption over time, even controlling for how much sugar you were consuming at age six? And the answer is yes. 
The longer your ADHD goes on, the more sugar individuals are likely to be consuming, telling us what we said earlier, that ADHD predisposes to sugar consumption and not the other way around. So that's one piece of evidence, but it's not the entire picture. There's other forms of evidence as well. Let's take a look at another study. This was a huge study of adults done in Sweden that involved nearly 18,000 pairs of twins, right? And as you know, we can calculate the degree to which genetics and various environmental sources contribute to a trait, ADHD in this case, by using twins, comparing identical twins to fraternal twins and siblings and so on. And mathematically, we won't go into that, but the twin methodology is a tried and true, well-established method for looking at the contribution of genetic factors to a trait, ADHD in this case. What did these authors find? They found that there was a relationship between ADHD and sugar consumption. It wasn't very large, but it was there. <clears throat> they also found that that relationship was explained by shared underlying genetic factors, so that the genes that were contributing to ADHD were also the genes contributing to consuming too much sugar. And the authors go on to reason that one reason for that is that ADHD predisposes to addictive behavior, addiction to drugs, addiction to alcohol, to tobacco, to marijuana, to video games and internet gaming, and so on. We know that ADHD is associated with a higher risk for addictive type behavior, including binge eating disorder and even bulimia. So they argue that what you're seeing here is shared genetic risk across different domains of behavior, both ADHD and consuming sugar. So that also refutes the idea that the sugar is causing the ADHD. Both may be arising from underlying shared genetics toward, again, probably addictive propensities. Now, the authors did find something I found rather startling. The majority of the variation in the relationship between ADHD and sugar consumption, although there was a genetic contribution, was primarily explained by what is called non-shared environment, which is environments that occur to only one member of the twin dyad and not in the other. And there are many things that can happen that are not shared. They can be diseases, infections, accidental injuries, things that happen to one twin and not the other. I'm a twin and there were things that happened to my brother that didn't happen to me and so on. One of the things that may be possible here as part of that non-shared environment is the degree to which these individuals are opting into environments where sugar-containing, fast food, high-carb, Western-type, high sugar foods are more readily available or more likely to be consumed. Now, that could be in your peer relationships where you're associating with peers who are eating a lot of junk food, sugar especially. It could also be that you're hanging around in environments where those kinds of foods are very readily available, especially to an impulsive person. Whereas the other twin, maybe in an entirely different environment. Remember, these are adults, they've already left home. So that the non-shared environment is not something that's happening in the household, something that's happening out there in society. But no matter what they're finding is that sugar isn't causing ADHD, it's related to ADHD, but it could also be related to the opportunities to consume sugar out there in the environment. Again. The higher your ADHD symptoms, the more you may be seeking out sugar and other forms of immediate reinforcement gratification, uh, and in this case, through your diet. So this also gives the lie to the idea that sugar is causing ADHD. Now, another line of evidence against this causal relationship between sugar and ADHD is to simply go out and do direct interventions in which you give sugar and placebos like aspartame to individuals, 
children and adolescents in this particular study, and they don't know, neither the kids nor their parents know which days the individuals are getting the sugar and which days they're getting the sugar substitute. And this review found that there were a number of studies, at least I think six or more, but no matter, a number of studies that found that when you do this kind of direct intervention and manipulation, all of the studies found nothing, no differences between the sugar and the placebo. There again, evidence against any idea that you hold that sugar is causing the ADHD symptoms. So there's three lines of evidence right there against this idea of interpreting that correlation as causation between sugar and ADHD. One study that goes back to 1985, this done by two friends and colleagues of mine, Dr. Mark Walrasch, a developmental pediatrician, uh, and the late Richard Milich. Uh, and this study was exactly what I described, where they, on certain days, gave sugar to the children. On other days, they gave a placebo aspartame to the children, and the parents didn't know which days were which. And when they looked at the assessment of the kids' ADHD behavior, both through ratings and observations, there were no differences. And they concluded, even back nearly 40 years ago, they concluded that there is no evidence that sugar is causing the ADHD. And there have been many studies since then that found the same thing. Now, about nine years later, Richard Milich and one of his students, Dan Hoover, did a study that might explain what's going on here. They took typical children, not ADHD children, but typical children whose parents had said that their children were very sugar sensitive. They split the children into two groups. Both groups were given a placebo, aspartame, but half of the groups, the mothers were told it was sugar. And the other half, they were told it was a placebo, but none of the children actually got sugar. What did they find? The group in which the mothers thought their children had received sugar, reported that the children were worse, not only in their ratings, but in their indirect observations of the mother's behavior with the children. The mother had become more controlling, more commanding, more directive of their children, just knowing that their kids had had this sugar. So it shows you that parental expectations about sugar are likely to be explaining these reports out there, these anecdotes from parents that sugar is causing the ADHD. No, it's not. It's your expectations about what sugar might do to your children that appears to be one of the factors explaining this association. And mind you, this wasn't even done with ADHD children, but children whose parents thought they were sugar sensitive. So. This again lays to rest the idea that sugar's causing the ADHD and leaves us back at the alternative explanation, which seems much more reasonable now, that the higher your ADHD symptoms, the more likely you are seeking out sugar-containing foods and beverages to consume. Hence the increase in obesity, in binge eating, in bulimia, in type 2 diabetes, in dental caries, and all the other downstream effects of higher than typical consumption of sugar. Okay, hopefully that puts that to rest. Now, one of my subscribers, Allison, thank you for the suggestion. Allison wrote and said, hey Russ, would you go and take a look at this website? Because here's a guy claiming not that sugar is causing ADHD, but there's something about ADHD that is leading to some kind of problem or difference in sugar metabolism and use in the brain. So he's arguing, this is Dr. Greenblatt over at his website, finallyfocused.org. He's arguing that how the ADHD brain processes sugar is different from what we see in typical children. Interesting hypothesis. I'd, I'd never heard of this before. But I went through and I read the evidence he cites, 
and I'm very familiar with that evidence, and it just can't be. Here's what he does. He says that, okay, we go out and we do scanning studies of ADHD children's brains compared to typical kids' brains or even adults, okay? And some of these scanning methods like spec scanning or others like positron emission tomography, but especially spec scan, some of them are using blood glucose to measure brain activity. So they give you a little radioactive dye that binds to the glucose in the blood, and when it enters the brain, they can track where the blood sugar is going and where it's being used and where it's not being used. Now, mind you, this is a way of determining how active areas of the brain are. It has nothing to do with a problem with glucose metabolism in those re regions. It's simply a reflection of how active or inactive the region is. And yes, many studies do find that there is lower blood glucose metabolism in certain regions of the brains of people with ADHD. But that is simply an indicator that there's less activity going on there. When we give stimulant medication or do other things to increase activity in that brain, blood glucose metabolism goes back up, suggesting that there's nothing wrong with the way the brain is metabolizing glucose. It's in the brain matter itself. There are problems in brain development and functioning, and the blood glucose is simply a reflection of those differences in brain activity. It would be like you driving your car at a slower rate of speed, and therefore it's consuming less gasoline, and there you conclude that, oh my God, there's something wrong with the way my car is metabolizing gasoline. No, there isn't. The gasoline consumption is just a byproduct of how active the engine is. In this case, the glucose metabolism is just a byproduct of how active or inactive brain regions are. So I'm sorry, but this website gets it all wrong. There is no evidence that there's some problem in the brain with glucose metabolism. There is a problem with brain activity, functioning, interconnectedness, and so on, as I've talked about on this channel many times. So thanks again, Allison, for bringing that to my attention. So there you have it. Once again, we're gonna whack that mole back down into his hole. That sugar hypothesis should go back into oblivion on the dustbin of history because it simply isn't so that sugar causes ADHD. But there probably is a relationship between how much ADHD you have and how much you are likely to consume sugar. The causation is the other way around. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this and found it informative. And to those of you who subscribe, thank you. If you haven't subscribed, please consider it as well. We're approaching 100,000 subscribers. I hope to meet that by the end of May. Wouldn't that be wonderful uh, within one year? But no pressure, just wanted you to know that. All right, I'll see you again next week. Thanks for joining me. And as always, live well and be well. Thanks, everybody.